Welcome back to that God Power channel. This is the channel where we're going to unlock the God Power that's laying dormant on the inside of you. But first today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue with our breakdown of the Bible, specifically the book of Matthew. And I believe that we are on chapter 18 now. If you didn't see chapter 17, I would highly advise you to go back and watch it because it was really dope. Um, but now we're on chapter 18. Now, before we jump into it, I wanted to say something to you guys. Um, for those of you who have been waiting for chapter 18 to come out, um, you notice that it's taken about five days. Well, in the last five days here, me and my girlfriend have just actually been getting our atmosphere right in our home. Um, just cleaning up everything. You can call it like spring clean, even though it's like the end of summer. <laughs> That's basically what we were doing this whole week is spring cleaning, getting our atmosphere right. Um, we saw a sermon about atmosphere and it really touched us, so we decided to get our atmosphere right, and it totally made a difference. But, with no further ado, let's jump into chapter 18. <laughs> so in verse 1, it says, The disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to them, and he's like, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like children, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples were really curious. They just wanted to know what's the hierarchy like. And uh, they wanted to know where they fit into it all. That's why I'm guessing they asked it. But they learned that they've been corrupted as adults. And that's still true today. As we grow up, we lose our innocence. Um, and we become corrupt more and more and more the older we get. Um, but... We also become more wise, and so we can choose to follow that corruption or to resist it. And Jesus is saying, unless you turn from your ways uh, and be like children, then you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. You won't be able to see all the beauty that he's got for you. So going forward to verse 5, he's like, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, all these people who are taking the children's minds and corrupting them with filth and just bullshit, those people are going to have a hard time when it comes to Judgment Day according to this. Um, because Jesus is like, nah, dude, you don't supposed to corrupt the little children. They're innocent. So... After Jesus answered the question of the disciples, he started to teach them, or he warns them against temptation, basically. He, he teaches them about the concept of temptation and why it's not good. And that's in verse 7. And what he says is, What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both your hands and your feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. So basically, Jesus is saying that since the world tempts people with so many temptations, the world as a person or as a being is going to have some sorrow to face when it comes to judgment day. Um, but he's saying if you're a person in the world or of the world that is tempting others, then you're going to also have sorrow to face. But then he goes on to say that if you are um, falling because of your hands and your feet or your eyes to temptation, get rid of those things. Now, this verse has been taken literally. But what I think he means by gouging out your eyes and cutting off your foot is you're trying to cut off your foot, bruh. Definitely not. So don't let your foot cause you to sin. You know what I'm saying? Are you trying to gouge out your eyes? Hell no. So keep your eyes focused on that that is not sin. You know what I'm saying? Keep it off of lust. That's that's what God is saying. It's better to get rid of those things, dismember yourself, than to be judged for those things. So if you don't want to dismember yourself, you feel me? Like Just get yourself right because it's the easier option. Now in verse 10, Jesus warns against looking down on other people. He's like, beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly father. So I took this as don't ever mess with the young people because at, at a time, there's a time when the angels 
this is just me in my imagination. I think the angels are going through like a training camp in front of God and God's telling them, you know what I'm saying? He's setting the ropes. This is how you, you deal with your human and whatnot. And then when they grow up, they're able to come interact. But for a time that they're they're in heaven. And that's how I kind of interpret that verse. I'm sure y'all have something to say in the comments about that. So definitely drop a comment below. And then Jesus goes on to say, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out and search for that one lost sheep? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than the 99 that didn't wander away. So in that same way, it is not my heavenly father's will that even one of these little ones shall perish. And this is a point where I think that we actually should stop and explore because I know that if we all read the same news headlines, we see children death all the time. And Jesus is saying it's not his father's will that even one of the little ones will perish. So it makes you honestly think about what Jesus is saying. And for moments like this, instead of saying, oh, the Bible's fake, oh, he's contradictory. This is the moment where you'd be like, all right, God, I don't really understand that part, bro. Can you please enlighten me, give me wisdom, and give me knowledge so I can understand what was written in that part. Because from what I see, it's contradictory to that. I promise if you really meditate on that prayer right there the answer to you will come that verse will become more and more clear so when it becomes clear to me i'll share it with y'all and i'm sure within the next few days it'll come clear so look at look out for it in the next videos and if it's clear to you already drop it in the comments so you can enlighten us all so going on to verse 15 jesus starts teaching how to treat a believer who sins he's like if another believer sins against you go privately and point out their offense. If that other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or more uh, people with you and go back so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. But if that person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. And then if he or she won't accept what the church has to say, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And what I think Jesus is saying by that is because our eternal will continue to go on even after we die on earth. Um, that mindset that we create on earth, like the things that we allow, the things that we don't allow, um, the, the constant thoughts in our mind will carry on to the next uh, realm or whatever is next after life. That's what I think Jesus is actually saying by that one. So in verse 19, he also says, I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. So Jesus is like, yo, I'm right here with you. If you band up and you guys are believing on God, I'm going to be in the presence. So God's definitely going to answer you. Uh, verse number 21, then Peter said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive somebody who sins against me? Seven times? And then Jesus is like, nah, not seven times. But how about 70 times seven times? And then Jesus goes on to tell a big old parable or metaphor about a king. And so he really kind of, this is my favorite part. He, he explains uh, forgiveness here. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring all his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay it, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed to pay the debt. But the man fell down on his face before the master and begged him, please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him. And he forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed that dude by the throat and he demanded you pay me instantly. His fellow servant fell down on his face and begged him for a little bit more time. Be patient with me. I'm going to pay it in time, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't let him wait. And so he had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. And they went to the king and they snitched on the dude. They told him everything that happened. 
Then the king called in the man that he had forgiven. He was like, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had mercy on you? Then the angered king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. This is what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. That is deep. And I really love that story. Jesus is like the best storyteller in the world. Because in that story, he literally just told you why is oh, I mean, why you should forgive people. And he compared it to what God's going to do to you if you don't. God's going to be just like the king. So if you're walking around and you have not forgiven some people with your heart, not just with your words, not just topical, like in all of your being, you need to forgive everybody. You know what I'm saying? And forgiving everybody is the key to get to the kingdom of heaven. Whether it's the kingdom of heaven, which is the mindset here on earth, or the kingdom of heaven in the life to come after this one, the eternal part of life. So I would highly advise you guys to meditate on forgiveness and clear your heart. If, you, if there's anybody that you haven't forgiven um, that you need to, take the time out today. Call them, text them, you know what I'm saying? Forgive that person. And it's going to feel way better for you. Like you're going to feel lighter. You're going to feel better. So thank you, everybody, for rocking out with me today. That ends chapter 18 of the book of Matthew. Um, we will be doing chapter 19 soon, and I promise I won't wait five days again to do it. But thank you again. Make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and share it. And always remember that you got that God power. Living the God power. I got the God Tapping the sources, calling the vibes. I just thank God I'm alive. I just thank God that I'm fly. I just thank God for my guns. Every night, we never stay up in my spirit.